Good morning, everyone, and can I give you a warm welcome to the Burness Paul Construction Law webinar this morning. Um, this is the fourth in our series of the impact of COVID-19 on the construction industry, and I'm pleased to say that today we're finally looking at coming out of lockdown and the issues raised um, by getting back to site. So, positive steps ahead. I am Fenella Mason, and I am the head of the talented construction team at Burness Paul, and I'm chairing our session today. I'm joined today by four of my colleagues, um, Gavin Payton, Kate Primrose, James Forbes, all from the construction and projects team, and also by Lynn Gray from our health and safety team. And we also have in the audience Alistair Sutherland, who heads up our planning team. So if any planning questions occur to you during the course of the session, please don't hesitate to raise them at the end and Alistair is there and will be happy to, to answer them for you. We have found that uh, COVID queries have been coming in thick and fast over the last three months and all of our speakers have been dealing with COVID queries on just about a daily basis. So please, if you have any questions, don't hesitate to ask by the WebEx chat function today or get in touch with, with us after the seminar. Now, our agenda for today, Gavin, if you could go on to the agenda slide. Our first speaker will be Gavin, and Gavin is going to cover our route out of lockdown, or the industry's route out of lockdown, looking at the Scottish Government guidance and the Construction Scotland six-phase plan for return to site. Gavin is followed by Kate Primrose, and Kate's looking at acceleration agreements which are a key issue for parties looking to make up for the time lost as a result of the shutdown. And I know that um, Kate, amongst others in the team, have been looking at clients' queries in relation to acceleration agreements. James is going to talk to us about insolvency and payment issues and important changes um, that are coming through to the insolvency legislation. And I think I'm right in saying James will um, pick up on this, that these are being rushed through and as a result of the um, current situation. And then finally, Lynn Gray from Health and Safety Team is going to give us the health and safety perspective on managing your way out of lockdown. So just before I hand over to Gavin, um, a couple of housekeeping issues. Again, if you can keep your phones on mute, please. Um, the session will be recorded if you could keep your questions to WebEx chat function and direct them to me. I will pick them up with the speakers at the end of the session for you. We are expecting the talks to finish within about 50 minutes, so that leaves us about 10 minutes at the end for questions. So with that, I will hand you over to Gavin for our first presentation. Thanks, Vanilla. Um, to properly assess uh, how we navigate out of lockdown, we need to understand the framework that we're currently working within. The construction sector continues to grapple with an extremely challenging and fluid environment. One of those challenges is to keep on top of the non-mandatory guidance and mandatory statutory requirements being issued by the UK and Scottish governments. For those operating UK-wide, it's also difficult to digest and reconcile the inconsistent guidance being issued by Westminster and by Holyrood. Throughout the pandemic, the UK government's position has been that construction sites are not required to close so long as it's safe to keep working. However, restrictions on construction sites in Scotland have been more stringent than the rest of the UK, as at today's date, Scottish government guidance remains that non-essential construction sites should remain closed. Notwithstanding that the guidance is not mandatory, there, and there has never been an express legal requirement for construction sites in Scotland to close, most have complied with the guidance on a voluntary basis. The only current COVID-19 specific legal requirement for construction sites in Scotland is to socially distance on site. However, um, as well as considering the rafts of COVID-19 specific guidance and legislation being issued by government, the construction industry also has to give careful consideration to compliance with general duties under health and safety law in this COVID-19 world. It's interesting to note that there's a clear difference in emphasis and statements issued by the HSE north and south of the border. 
And that difference in emphasis broadly reflects the difference in emphasis of the Scottish and UK governments. Reviewing the HSE statements, it seems reasonable to me to reach the following um, three conclusions, although I should say that these are not expressly stated by HSE. These are the conclusions I reach uh, based on what they've said. Firstly, that reopening a construction site today, or indeed having opened a reconstruction site at any time during the pandemic to date, would not necessarily be considered by HSE to be a breach of health and safety law. However, applying health and safety law to the circumstances of a particular site could require closure of the site or require special arrangements to allow it to stay open. Secondly, a failure to comply with Scottish Government guidance on the closure of non-essential sites would not necessarily be considered by HSE to be a breach of health and safety law. However, those that do not comply with guidance should be ready to defend their position uh, that they are complying with health and safety law, notwithstanding the non-compliance with Scottish Government guidance. Lastly, in my view, the HCC cannot insist upon more restrictive measures being applied in Scotland based purely on the more restrictive public health guidance issued in Scotland. And that's because the health and safety law is the same UK-wide. My partner, Lynn Gray, uh, will consider health and safety issues in more detail towards the end of this session. So, on the 21st of May, the Scottish Government published Scotland's route map through and out of the crisis. This four-phase route map applies generally to the nation and does not apply specifically to the construction sector. The general route map provides an indication of the order in which the current restrictions will be lifted, but importantly, does not specify dates for moving through the different phases. Reviews will continue to be held every three weeks as a minimum to assess whether each phase can be accelerated or needs to be decelerated. The Scottish Government have said that they're keeping an open mind on the potential for regional variation as we go through the phases of the route map. To date, the construction sector has been wrestling with the differences in approach between Scotland and the rest of the UK. Now there's a prospect of even greater complications arising out of regional variations in Scotland. Moving on then, and, and coinciding with the publication of the four phase route map, the coronavirus construction sector guidance was also substantially updated as at the 29th of May. The update includes a six phase restart plan developed by Construction Scotland and which was adopted by the Scottish Government. And that updated guidance also anticipates easing of restrictions in a phased manner. The six phases of that restart plan are shown uh, in this slide here. I don't intend to um, run through them all individually, um, but they're, they're there for reference. And as I said, the, the six phase restart plan was developed by Construction Scotland. And there's more detail behind each of those phases set out in documentation on the Construction Scotland website, which is well worth a look. We're currently in phase zero planning and phase one pre-start site preparation of the restart plan. Phase zero includes activities such as revising health and safety plans, risk assessments, and method statements. And phase one includes activities such as preparing sites for recommencement, including welfare facilities, cleaning, signage, and security, really all in anticipation of accommodating social distancing. It's also anticipated that deliveries to site may commence during phase one. One of the key headlines then is that as things stand, guidance remains that construction operations should not restart properly on site. I referred earlier to confusion around the difference between law and guidance and the differences in approach throughout the UK. We're also seeing a reasonable amount of confusion being generated by the numbering of the six phases of the restart plan as zero to five rather than one to six. The Scottish Government said that they were planning to implement the first two phases. In some instances, that's been misinterpreted to mean phase one and phase two rather than phase zero and phase one. And we've seen some publications to that effect. But to be clear, we are currently only on phase zero and phase one of the restart plan, which does not include a restart of construction operations proper on site. 
The Scottish Government um, have said that progress beyond phase zero and phase one will depend on a range of factors, and those include construction industry's ability to demonstrate fully compliant working practices, the confidence of the workforce and its trade union representatives in those arrangements, and wider supporting health data. So all of those factors um, will be taken into account. In addition, the decision to move to phase two of the construction sector's plan, being soft restart, will only be made after consultation with government to ensure it's safe to do so and in line with public health advice. Now, the guidance does not clarify who has to consult with government prior to the move to phase two, and that's something that clients and contacts are, are asking us about. My assumption is that the consultation will be with Construction Scotland, given that the six-phase restart plan was developed by them prior to being adopted by the Scottish Government. However, I would be interested to hear views at the Q&A session at the end on that point as to who people think the consultation needs to be with. Although no fixed time period is given, the Scottish Government have suggested that it will be at least two weeks from the 28th of May before Phase 2 uh, can be commenced. It could be longer. Indeed, the next review cycle ends on the 18th of June. Phase 2, uh, known as soft restart, um, that's anticipated to include a slow build-up of workforce to optimal capacity with physical distancing and no use of COVID-19 personal protective equipment. And also, uh, it will involve familiarisation with the new site arrangements. It's interesting to note that when we eventually get to phase three, the guidance will only have reached a stage that's on a par with the current legal restrictions. It's only when we get to reach stage four, or phase four, that the guidance will be more permissive than the current legal restrictions. The Scottish Government have confirmed that if at any stage the evidence suggests that construction activity is leading to an increase in infection rates, they will have to consider tightening up restrictions again, something we all have to be very conscious of. As I said, um, the Construction Scotland's plan describing each of the six phases uh, of the restart plan in more detail is available on their website. And actually, it's got some good annexations as well that give examples um, of, of what might be be required and programming requirements. Um, the updated construction guidance also needs to be read in conjunction with the Scottish Government's business and physical distancing guidance. Um, the Construction Leadership Council's site operating procedures provide detailed guidance uh, to the construction sector on how to protect workers in the shadow of COVID-19. Also, um, the Scottish Government are seeking to learn uh, from successful working practices on the essential sites that remained operational through the, throughout the pandemic and are looking for industry to develop in innovative processes to support new ways of working. Also, given the number of countries ahead of us in terms of the curve in COVID-19 cycle, we can learn from their experiences of moving out of lockdown. The guidance emphasises the importance of undertaking robust and ongoing risk assessments with full input from trade unions or worker representatives, and that all risk mitigation measures must be kept under regular review so that workplaces continue to feel and to be safe. Reconciling all of the COVID-19 specific guidance and legislation with existing health and safety duties is not an easy task. If you require assistance with that, please don't hesitate to get in touch with, with any member of the team. The six phase construction restart plan gives us a vision of the likely steps uh, in the route out of the construction lockdown in Scotland. However, we have no certainty as to the timing of those steps or indeed whether we may stumble back down the path at certain points along the way. We would all like the timing of the steps in the restart plan to be more certain to allow greater certainty of planning and programming. But equally, we recognise that it would be foolhardy to press on applying fixed dates in the face of a possible resurgence of COVID-19. In my opinion, we have a very skilled, resourceful, adaptable and diligent construction sector in Scotland. It's up to all of us operating in it to demonstrate to the Scottish Government and the public at large that the construction sector can be trusted to move steadily and safely through the six phases of the restart plan as quickly as possible. Clearly, the ability of the construction sector to move forward will in part 
be dependent on the actions of other sectors of the business community and society at large, and the impact all of that has on COVID-19. But we have to focus on what we can influence and do that to the best of our ability. The next review cycle, as I say, ends on the 18th of June, but it is possible that we'll move to phase two uh, of the six-phase plan in advance of that. Let's hope that COVID-19 stats continue to improve and the construction sector can take further confident steps forward out of lockdown. I'd be delighted to take questions and hear your views at the Q&A session at the end, but in the meantime, I'll hand over to Kate Primrose, who will talk about a topic that we've been asked about a lot at the moment, which is acceleration agreements. Kate? Okay, thanks, Gavin. Uh, morning, everyone. Um, so today I'm going to talk about the possibility of accelerating out of lockdown. So clearly COVID-19 has caused significant delay to numerous projects across the UK. However, it could still be critical from an employer's perspective that a project completes by a specific date, whether that be for funding reasons or due to the nature of the development. So for example, a school or a student accommodation development um, would typically be programmed to ensure they're completed in advance of an academic year. So as the government takes steps to move out of lockdown and as we begin to move through the construction phase restart plan that Gavin has talked about, parties may seek to agree to accelerate works to try to make up for time lost due to COVID-19. And as Finnell has mentioned, we have in fact already seen some clients come to us to discuss this option. You could move to the next slide, please. So what is acceleration? Acceleration is when a contractor actively takes measures to speed up the progress of the works in order to achieve either the originally anticipated completion date or at least an earlier completion date than would have been achieved if no acceleration measures were employed. Could move on to the next slide, please. So acceleration measures that are typically taken would include firstly increasing the number of personnel on site although that could obviously be difficult with the social distancing requirements, extending working hours on site, and a letter was issued from the chief planner at the end of May stating that planning authorities should be generally supportive of reasonable requests to extend working hours on construction sites. And what is reasonable will obviously depend on the nature and the location of the development. And finally, another acceleration measure that I've mentioned on the slides that might be employed it could be changing designs and specifications to allow the use of more efficient construction methods and more readily available materials. You could move on to the next slide, please. Thanks. Um, what, so what is an acceleration agreement? So a number of standard form building contracts have expressed terms addressing potential acceleration. So for example, in the SBCC and JCT standard building contracts and design and build contracts, um, they have optional acceleration provisions. Also, you'll find in the NEC4 engineering and construction contract, um, that also has an acceleration provision. Um, and this is where a contractor may be asked to submit a lump sum price in exchange for acceleration. However, where a building contract doesn't have any such express terms or where the agreement to accelerate is part of, um, for example, a settlement for extension of time claims, then it's best practice to formally record this agreement by entering into an acceleration agreement. So this would be an express formal agreement whereby the contractor agrees to accelerate the works to complete by a revised completion date. The parties agree on the acceleration measures to be employed and the contractor is paid an acceleration payment. You can move on to the next slide, please. So what do you need to consider when you're entering into an acceleration agreement? So I've, I've run through the basic points in an acceleration agreement, but now I'm going to go through in a bit more detail some points to consider if you're thinking about entering into an acceleration agreement, including some more specific points that we've seen parties seek to include recently. So first of all, what acceleration measures are to be employed? So I've just touched on some of the options um, there already, but the ones, um, the ones I've covered are the typical ones we've seen, but there could obviously be other acceleration measures. Um, what is the revised completion date and the revised program? Um, and the contractor would obviously have to factor in the current restrictions in terms of social distancing requirements when programming the work. 
um, payments, what acceleration payments has been agreed. So it's unlikely for obvious reasons that a contractor would ever agree to accelerate works and incur the costs to employ the acceleration measures without an acceleration payment being made. So I think that's a key point to consider. Acceleration generally comes at a cost to an employer. So an employer would need to weigh up its options in terms of how time critical the works are against the cost payable to the contractor for accelerating. Typically, we see parties agreeing that this acceleration payment is a lump sum figure that's added to the contract sum, with the amount obviously being dependent on um, the commercial negotiations between the parties. Although it is possible that parties will agree the payment is on a cost reimbursable open book basis, and there are obviously pros and cons to this from each party's perspective. I think generally the aim is to reflect the additional costs that are likely to be incurred by the contractor in employing the agreed acceleration measures. So that would be costs for increasing the workforce size, for example, um, paying for overtime for extended working hours increased materials costs and equipment costs, and expenses linked to different working methods and sequencing. Another point um, to consider is any claims that have been made to date. So parties would, want, would usually want to agree to settle all outstanding claims for extensions of time, all loss and expense claims, and all changes relating to the period prior to the date of the acceleration agreement. So if parties don't agree how to address past entitlement to such claims, then there will obviously be uncertainty over the revised completion date and any additional sums payable going forward, which is problematic from both parties' perspectives and could, of course, cause future disputes. Another thing that we sometimes see as an added incentive is an employer agreeing that a bonus payment will be made if it completes a project by a fixed date which is usually not extend extendable except in limited circumstances. So if the contractor doesn't complete by the fixed date, then the contractor wouldn't be entitled to the bonus payment, even if an extension of time has been granted. So if an extension of time has been granted, then the contractor wouldn't, of course, be liable for liquidated damages, but it would, however, lose its right to the bonus payment. So as I've said, bonus payments are not always included in acceleration agreements, but they're just another option that we've seen uh, some, some parties seek to include. Um, another thing we sometimes see is parties agreeing to amend the liquidated damages provisions as part of the wider commercial agreement. Again, it just depends on the specific circumstances. Parties will also want to properly record changes to the contract documents, so changes to the specification and scope, contract sum analysis, programme, etc., to reflect the acceleration measures, revised timescales and revised payments. Um, a final point to note is that acceleration agreements don't usually cover a future claim for an extension of time. So a contractor could therefore still make a claim for an extension of time in the usual way in respect of a future delay after the acceleration agreement has been entered into. So this is something an employer should consider. There's still a chance of further delays, even if you enter into an acceleration agreement, and that goes for loss and, loss and expense claims and changes as well. So the provisions of the building contract will still stand. Could move on to the next slide, please. So that was just a very quick rundown of the key things that we've seen clients consider when entering into an acceleration agreement. Um, something to flag um, is obviously that acceleration agreements can be expensive for an employer. However, where a project is time critical, then it might be considered necessary from a commercial perspective for work to be accelerated. So typically, acceleration occurs when a project has been delayed of a as a result of an event for which the employer takes a risk. So extensions of time have been granted and the employer decides that it makes commercial sense to pay a sum of money to the contractor in exchange for the contractor accelerating the work. However, something to consider is that even if the delay is a contractor risk, so the contractor is not entitled to any extension of time and will be unable to complete by the contractually required date, so will in fact be liable to pay liquidated damages, it's still possible that an employer will consider paying a contractor to accelerate if the liquidated damages payable by the contractor for delay will not cover all of the employer's losses and 
the acceleration payment is less than the anticipated shortfall between the liquidated damages payable and the actual loss incurred by the employer. Also, there may be circumstances in the current um, situation whereby it's not clear which party is taking the risk for delay and parties decide to come to some sort of commercial arrangement via an acceleration agreement. So I think the purpose of today is just to flag to you that in the current climate, we've already, we're have already already beginning to see parties trying to make up for lost time due to COVID-19 delays by looking to agree to accelerate out of lockdown. And whether this is right for your project will obviously be dependent on the specific circumstances and the commercial position of the parties, but it's an option that we might begin to see becoming increasingly popular. So if you want a bit more information, I issued a blog yesterday dealing detailing some of the key points that I've touched on today um, and we'll circulate this after the webinar as well so please do feel free to get in touch. I'll hand over to James now. Thank you. Next slide Gavin. Um, it will be an unfortunate consequence of the current COVID-19 crisis that we see more and more insolvency in the construction sector. And as Gavin said, there's still some confusion in the marketplace about the force of Scottish Government guidance and what constitutes an essential project. We are seeing a gradual return to work with the Scottish Government's phase plan to ease lockdown, allowing construction sites to move to phase one of the sector's restart plan. But phase one, of course, does not allow recommitments from the full construction operations. And from a contractor's perspective, the risk of insolvency is increased by a number of factors. Suspension of works will affect the contractor's cash flow. Force majeure claims arising from COVID-19 will generally award time, but not money. Productivity will be down due to social distancing measures. Availability of materials will be more challenging. There will be a tightening of the lending market and inevitably there will be a lack of new projects coming on stream. Employers will be similarly affected. Social distancing and supply chain issues will drive up the costs of construction. And in many cases, the market has changed so much that pre-COVID projects, which were once financially viable, are now being reassessed. For example, Will there be the same demand for student accommodation given the predicted drop in the number of foreign students and the preference for domestic students to defer for a year in the hope that they can enjoy a more normal student experience? The standard form JCT and SBCC contracts contain detailed provisions dealing with insolvency. Next slide, please. On contractor insolvency, the employer can decide to terminate by notice, irrespective of whether the employer decides to serve that termination notice. On contractor insolvency, three provisions are automatically triggered. The contractor's obligations to carry on with the works are suspended. The, the employer can take immediate measures to secure the site and protect the works and materials, and no further sums shall become due to the contractor. The contractor has a long wait for further payment based on a reconciliation statement, up to three months following the making good where the project is built out by others, or up to eight months from the date of termination if the employer decides not to complete the project. So perhaps the employer has a pent company guarantee which might offer a quick payment of these damages. We all know that there are no st standard form parent company guarantees as each corporate structure is different, but the market position on guarantees is fairly well settled and most guarantees follow a similar template. The obvious concern with any guarantee is the solvency of the underlying parent company. Does it have the ability to meet a claim when its contracting arm has become insolvent? Secondly, a parent company guarantee is normally a performance guarantee. The guarantor's liability is created by the failure of the contractor company to perform its obligations, and so is no greater than the liability of the contracting company under the contract itself. So if a parent company, can't, a parent company guarantee can't help you, then perhaps the employer has a performance bond which is triggered on insolvency. 
If we look at the commonly placed bonds by the Association of British Insurers, an ABI bond, the core clause guarantees payment of damages, quote, as ascertained and established pursuant to in accordance with the contract. The demand is conditional on the claim being established and ascertained in terms of the contract, and that's where the term a conditional bond comes from. So you have to get to that reconciliation statement before the damages arising from termination are ascertained and established by reference to the contract. In contrast to that, some form of on-demand instrument, such as a letter or an on-demand bond, could address this. But as we know, these forms of liquid security are costly and often difficult to place in the market. An alternative might be some form of composite bond, which is a conditional bond like the ABI bond, but with a discrete on-demand element to cover those direct expenses, losses or damages arising from the termination. And this is certainly the type of bond that we recommend to our clients, and that's our core style of bond uh, that we would offer in any uh, negotiation of a transaction. But before leaving the topic of bonds, it's worth touching on what the bond market is doing in reaction to COVID-19. Bonds are priced on risk, and typically the cost of the bond excluding any cross guarantees can be in the range of 0.75 to 8% of the bond value. And where you end up in that range is subject to a number of factors such as covenant, turnover and claims record. And from conversations we've had with our clients and bondsmen recently, we're hearing that sureties are adding up to 0.5% to account for the additional risks presented by COVID-19. Turning back to insolvency itself, if the employer itself becomes insolvent, the contractor may, may by notice terminate the building contract and he is relieved of his obligations to continue with the works from the date of insolvency, irrespective of whether or not he serves that termination notice. Like contractor insolvency, there is a reconciliation of the account and the contractor then gets his chance to claim direct loss and damages arising from the insolvency. I want to draw your attention to the new Corporate and Insolvency Governance Bill, which is fast-tracking its way through Parliament. That's what Fenella mentioned in her introduction. Uh, the bill will introduce Section 233B of the Into the Insolvency Act 1986. And these changes will have significant impact on construction contracts, and particularly the insolvency provisions within standard form contracts. Next slide, please. The bill itself is designed to introduce a variety of temporary and permanent measures to address the commercial impact of COVID-19. The policy statement that goes with the bill says it will quote, help companies trade through a restructuring or insolvency procedure, maximizing the opportunities for rescue of the company or the sale of the business as a going concern. And as we all know, a building contract is essentially a contract for the supply of goods and services. So in the context of the bill, the contractor is the supplier and the employer is the purchasing company. So what is the impact of this new section 233B? Well, in short, they are fundamental. They change the contractor's right to terminate under the building contract. Unfortunately, the, the confines of this uh, WebEx don't allow me to go into great detail in relation to the number of uh, sections within the bill. I would direct you, however, to my blog, which I wrote last Friday. It's available on our website and will be issued after this WebEx. But what I'll try and do is go through the, uh, the main provisions here to give you a flavour of what the bill might introduce. Subsection 3 of the bill, subsection 3 of 23CB, will prevent the contractor automatically terminating a building contract if the employer becomes subject to certain insolvency procedures. And these include administration, voluntary arrangement, or liquidation. There are, however, three exceptions to this prohibition. If an employer goes into administration or liquidation, the administrator or liquidator can consent to an automatic termination. 
Secondly, in any other form of insolvency, termination can occur if the insolvent company itself consents to the automatic termination. Thirdly, if a court is satisfied that the continuation of the contract would cause undue hardship, then automatic termination can occur. So if you don't get consent to the termination, either from the duty holder, the administrator, or the liquidator, or the insolvent company itself, then you may be forced to apply to the court to achieve automatic termination, which can be very expensive and time consuming, as we all know. Next slide, please. Subsection 7 prevents the supplier from making payment of claims due prior to insolvency a condition to their continuing performance. So in terms of a billing contract, the contractor cannot make payment of outstanding sums due a condition of continuing the works. Now, while subsection 233B would operate to exclude the contractor's right to terminate based on pre-insolvency events of default, post insolvency events of default could lead to a termination. So it's likely that any administrator or liquidator would require to pay for work already carried out, failing which a post-insolvency right to terminate could arise. It's important to note that these changes, which will affect the termination provisions in the standard form contracts, are not identified as temporary, whereas some of the other provisions in the bill are and will equally apply to subcontracts as they would to the main contract. The bill does contain a temporary exclusion for the operation of Section 233B, where the affected supplier is considered a small entity at the time the employer company became insolvent. In order to qualify for this small entity exclusion, in its most recent financial year, at least two of the following conditions must be met. Condition one, the supplier's turnover was no more than £10.2 million. Condition two, the supplier's balance sheet was not more than £5.1 million. Or condition three, the average number of the supplier's employees was not more than 50. So in the context of construction, potentially small subcontractors are likely to meet at least two of these thresholds and therefore qualify for small entity exclusion. Aside from the small entity exclusion, Section 233B will not apply to financial services firms and contracts, PPP and PFI companies, and some utilities and communications and IT service providers. In summary, this area has become much more complex by the introduction of Section 233B into the Insolvency Act, and I would urge you to seek legal advice for dealing with the termination scenario. I hope that gives you a flavour of the bill, and that concludes my presentation. Thanks for listening, and I'll hand you over to Lynn, who will talk about health and safety matters arising from COVID-19. Thanks very much, um, James, and good morning to everyone. Uh, thanks for, for still being with us. Um, this morning, I'm just going to reflect on a lot of the questions that, that we're being asked, as Fenella said, on a daily basis by clients who are concerned about how they can manage a safe way out of lockdown, um, including you know, issues around the guidance that Gavin hinted at um, and what may happen if you, you are accused of not complying with that. Uh, the extent of any liability that you could be exposed to as a business and also just reflect on some of the positive solutions that you can be looking at now um, to plan and prepare to ensure that you, you don't fall foul of any areas of non-compliance. If you can move on to the next slide, Gavin. Thanks. So one of the questions that we've been asked quite a lot, um, particularly in relation to construction because of the emerging divergence of approach between uh, the UK and Scottish Government, is what happens if you're accused of breaching government guidance? Um, it's worth reflecting at the start where the risks of any such accusation could come from. Um, the threats could be both internal and external. 
an employee or a third party who could be a visitor or a contractor to your site could make accusations that you are breaching government guidance in relation to COVID-19. They could claim that they've suffered injury as a result of any alleged breach of guidance, and that could be exposure to the virus or even development of a stress-related illness, including fatigue. And it's interesting reflecting on Kate's comments in relation to acceleration agreements. Um, and given the length of time that there has been during uh, lockdown and, and downtime on sites, there will be pressure to accelerate uh, and do things quicker. But obviously, health and safety concerns need to be considered in relation to any extension of working hours and how you may manage that, that safely. So it's, it's worth bearing that in mind as well. Um, so internally, employees uh, third part and third parties could accuse you of breaching the guidance. But also externally, you could have a well-meaning member of the public who considers or notices perhaps noise or activity on a site that's been dormant for a while and who would then report you to the authorities. Now, that could be the police um, or it could be one of the regulatory authorities, the health and safety executive or environmental health officers. As a result of that, you could have scrutiny on your site. Uh, which could lead to investigation and potential regulatory enforcement. Gavin mentioned this in his chat, but um, I just want to state again to remind you all that, that guidance is not the law unless it is explicitly stated as being mandatory. The intention behind guidance is to assist employers in complying with the law, including existing health and safety duties. So the new public health regulations which have come into force have necessitated the guidance, but that guidance is required to ensure that employers comply with all other laws which are relevant, including and which are directly relevant here, existing health and safety duties. I'm sure you're all aware that all employers have statutory duties to provide a safe place of work and they have a general duty of care to anyone accessing or visiting their place of business. Now, if you breach those statutory duties, in serious cases, you could face a criminal prosecution as a result of failing to take reasonably practicable steps to ensure employee safety. However, that's not the same as failing to follow or breach guidance, because you could breach the guidance without necessarily breaching your health and safety duties um, or your law. While the guidance is not the law, it's nonetheless regarded as the minimum that any business would require to do to ensure the health and safety of their employees and to be consistent with those legal duties that I've just explained. If you choose not to follow government guidance or any other applicable guidance to assist you in complying with your health and safety duties, any such deviance should be supported by a robust risk assessment because you would require to defend your position in the event of scrutiny. And I think, I mean, certainly the inquiries that we're seeing from clients range from proactive steps around planning to ensure non-compliance and also issues where they, they have had queries or um, concerns raised by both employees and well-meaning members of, of the public. Um, it's also possible, and I mention this because it's relevant for those of you who are involved in the decision making um, and management of health and safety within your organisations, for individuals to be liable for breaches of health and safety duties. Um, and that extends to directors, managers and officers of a company who can be found guilty of any health and safety offence which is committed with their consent, connivance or is attributable to their neglect. So that's relevant in that any decisions that you are making now could be challenged and you could be held accountable, not just as a business, but on an individual basis for those decisions in relation to health and safety where a breach has occurred. Any claim of breach of the guidance could result in investigation and ultimately the matter being reported to the Crown Office and Procurator Fiscal uh, Service in Scotland who are responsible for taking prosecutions. But that would only be where there had been harm caused by a failure in relation to the statutory health and safety duties that I mentioned earlier 
and that there's a public policy reason for taking any prosecution. So we consider that that would be, you know, very much at the extreme and it has to be much more than just breaching the guidance. You could breach the guidance and still be ensuring the health and safety of your workforce, provided you have a demonstrable audit trail, including a robust risk assessment process, justifying the actions that you have taken. Um, regardless of that, any scrutiny is likely to attract attention at the moment, particularly if you're a big name in the business, and reputational damage is something that is difficult to quantify but should not be underestimated in relation to a risk factor. Um, obviously, health and safety offences are criminal offences by nature. They are not covered by insurance. Your insurance may cover defence of any claim or any regulatory investigation, but they will not ultimately cover any fines that you could be issued with in relation to any breaches. And obviously, for directors, managers and officers and individual liability, insurance is not going to keep you out of prison. Um, and imprisonment is a possibility under the health and safety legislation for a breach. That's obviously quite a, a complicated uh, area and the issue of guidance and compliance has, has been even more complicated because of the divergence between um, the UK and the Scottish Government, as I said. If anyone wants specific advice on that, then we are very happy to discuss your particular circumstances with you and review plans you may have, including risk assessment and any measures to mitigate the risks, and we're happy to do that, so, so don't hesitate to get in touch. If you move on to the next slide, Gavin, we'll look at um, the extent of liability if an employee contracts COVID-19 at work. Um, the answer to that is, could you be liable if an employee contracts COVID-19 at work? Yes, potentially, but an employee would require to show two things, and that would be negligence on the part of an employer or another employee, and also that the negligence caused or materially contributed to the claimant contracting COVID. So it's quite a high burden and a high threshold that any employee would have to uh, prove to establish a, a viable claim in relation to liability for contracting COVID at work. Um, but again, as COVID-19 is a reportable disease now under RIDOR, then there's likelihood that uh, the, the regulator and others will be, will be put on notice um, if you have an instance of exposure at work. Any employee with, with mild symptoms is unlikely to um, claim. In practice, we expect claims in relation to exposure to or contraction of COVID at work are more likely to come from the vulnerable category of employees. But in most categories, it's going to be difficult for employees to establish on the balance of probabilities that exposure at work was the cause of them uh, contracting the virus. In reality, they could have picked up the virus anywhere. Even if an employee does contract COVID at work, it would still have to be as a result of an employer's negligence, i.e. a breach of your duty of care or statutory responsibilities. To ensure that you're in the best position to defend any claim, whether that's civil in relation to damages by an employee or a criminal claim, as I mentioned, in relation to regulatory scrutiny, now is the time that you need to ensure that you've, uh, you're ensuring that you've got your plans in place, you're complying with government guidance and any additional precautions require, required to ensure the health and safety of your employees. Um, and as I said, we can certainly help you in the planning with that. And if we move on to the next slide, Gavin, I'll have a, just a very brief look and a, a recap about the sort of things that, that you should be thinking about now um, and doing in this planning process and that you should have in place. When we've been advising clients, we've been looking at essentially, you know, four steps to coming out of lockdown in this planning issue. The main, the first point should be reviewing guidance. And that's any relevant guidance to your site. So from World Health Organization guidance, which is changing regularly, to uh, sector specific guidance, which is being issued um, again, being updated as things go on. 
So reviewing the guidance and determining what's relevant and applicable to your business is the first process. Then you require to carry out your COVID-19 risk assessment and make sure that you um, address all of the risks and identify the risks for COVID-19 in your business. And that relates to your operations and your people uh, and what you're actually doing, whether that's on site or remotely. It's also necessary to consult and there's a statutory obligation on employers to consult with employees in relation to material health and safety measures that are being taken in relation to risks that they've identified and COVID-19 certainly falls within that category. Now there's no requirement on how or when you should consult um, unless, although with elected um, representatives and where there's trade union representatives, you must consult with them. Um, the requirement is that you must do so in good time and to allow you to consult and take the views of your workforce and take that into account in determining your risk assessment before you make the decisions. So it should be a proactive step, not a reactive step or a box ticking exercise once you've decided what you're going to do. And then obviously the implementation um, is, is critical to ensuring the health and safety of your workforce and making sure that you get things right. Again, this shouldn't just be a tick box exercise. You need to identify specific measures that need to be taken in place and they need to be sufficiently robust to enable you to have a defence in the event that you were called upon to um, defend your position or any actions that you'd taken. So at the moment for construction, I would be encouraging you to look at existing health and safety policies. But in addition, you may need to consider sickness and absence policies and whether specific changes to those will be required, particularly in light of the new quarantine regulations that came into force yesterday and requirements to quarantine um, following travel out with the UK or coming back into the UK. You may have sponsored workers who are looking to come back to the UK to restart work and, and that may have an impact. Um, so sickness and absence policy is also relevant. Whistleblowing policy is relevant and that goes back to the initial point that I made regarding um, any concerns that anyone may have around the guidance and uh, the measures that you have in place, uh, particularly where you, they think you may be falling foul of those. Um, your disciplinary policy and another aspect that I'm mentioning because particularly for a lot, lots of clients who have sites where or businesses where there's physical activity required and it has to be done at a specific place, working from home is not something that you may have had to deal, deal with before but you may have people working from home now. Certainly one of the areas where there is consistency across both the UK and the devolved governments relates to working from home. And the, ve the message very much is if you can work from home, then you should be continuing to work from home until that guidance changes. Um, if you have not had a working from home policy before, you may want to look at that. If you still have some office based staff who you are looking to retain on a working from home basis, then you may want to consider whether there are any health and safety issues in relation to that um, and perhaps develop a working from home policy. Other protocols may be required in relation to COVID-19 specific requirements, particularly in relation to social distancing and hand washing, for etc., and the use of PPE or face masks. Um, visitors and contractors to site um, are a key factor in ensuring that you've got the trust and confidence of what's happening and you need to be talking to those people now and cooperating and making sure that people are aware of measures that you're intending to put in place to ensure that everything is, is safe. And as I mentioned, we are having queries from clients on a daily basis on all of these issues. Um, more than happy to uh, take questions at the end of the session, which we're just approaching now, or alternatively, if anyone would like to follow up with me after the WebEx, happy to chat. Um, I have uh, nothing else to add to that today. So I think, Fenella, I'll pass back to you and we can look at hopefully answering some questions if we've got time. 
Fantastic. Thank you very much for that, Lynn. Um, I hope you all found that a really interesting session of presentations. I know I certainly did. Um, and I don't think that's just because I've been locked up for three months. I think they were actually genuinely interesting. Um, one of the points that might be worth just picking up on, Kate had touched on the letter from the Chief Planning Officer. And I know we've got Alistair Sutherland, our uh, Head of Planning, um, in the audience. And I wondered, um, Alistair, if you could maybe just touch on whether there needs to be any sort of specific application in relation to extending operating hours on sites. Because I know that, as Kate mentioned, that might be part of the response, a sort of acceleration response. Yeah, thanks, Manella. Um, the, the short answer is, in most cases, no. Um, the, the, the chief planner's letter is, is, is quite instructive um, and in fact, it gives a very, a very strong steer to planning authorities about how they, they should deal with the particular issue of uh, relaxing conditions that might need to be relaxed to, to deal with, with coming out of lockdown, and in particular in relation to extending hours of operation. And, um, and actually, the chief planner has, has gone as far as, as saying to planning authorities that in, in, in most circumstances, it'd be reasonable to extend working hours from 7 a.m. to to 9 p.m. and and planning authorities should should simply agree that as a matter of of course um, and only if there's a, a compelling reason not to do so. So, for example, if I would um, obviously cause some kind of problem in a particular location, uh, then planning authorities should simply agree to that. But there doesn't there doesn't need to be any any formal agreement, so to speak. Um, but I would would definitely strongly recommend that. Uh, if a company is looking to change its hours of operation or transport movement um, or its construction management plan more, more generally that, that could lead to breach of planning control, then it, it does discuss that with planning officers at the earliest possible opportunity. Um, I mean, just picking up on a point that Lynn made there, you know, it's, it's, it's quite possible and, and conceivable and, and perhaps even likely that um, third parties or, or members of the public might complain to the planning authority or, or potentially to environmental health officers if suddenly, um, you know, what we've all got used to the peace and quiet of the current situation if construction starts up again and starts up in, in a fashion which seems like it's um, causing a, a problem or impacting on immunity, um, then what you really want to avoid is planning officers, environmental health, finding out about these extended hours of operation for the first time through a complaint rather than upfront from, from the contractor or the company itself. Um, again, the chief planner has, has really tried to encourage and in fact directed planning authorities to take a sympathetic approach, but what, what we don't want is, is for planning authorities to, to be unsympathetic if, if, if I say if they're hearing about it um, by way of a, a complaint. Um, I should say, actually, in terms of engaging with planning authorities at the earliest possible stage, it's a bit of a mixed picture across Scotland. Some some authorities are being are being fantastic. They're really well geared up for um, engaging with companies. Their their planning officers are uh, fully up to speed with what's happening, and they're able to work well. Um, and that's fine. But there are other planning authorities who are just struggling a wee bit, whether that's because of of personnel resource or, or IT infrastructure or other issues. So um, for some, some local authority areas, it's simply taking time to have discussions. So in this planning phase, in this phase zero and phase one of the six step phase, I think having um, really engaging early with the planning authority and environmental health would, would, would be the way forward. Um, uh, in, in other extreme situations, if, if actually if, if someone really does want to kind of push the boundaries in terms of extending hours or, or recommencing construction in a way that's going to cause quite a serious breach of planning control, then it may be that an application does need to be made to the planning authority to actually discharge a particular condition. Um, again, early discussion with the planning authority about whether or not that might be required would be, would be recommended. Fantastic. Thanks. Thanks, Alistair. Um, 
some more questions that we've got here. One perhaps for you, Gavin, um, as to whether it's within the current Scottish Government guidance for contractors to start on site before the 18th of June um, if all the necessary measures are in place. Yeah, happy to, to deal with that, Penella. Yeah, as I was saying in the, the, the presentation earlier, uh, we're currently uh, in phase one, uh, which is essentially pre-start site preparation. Now, the move to phase two um, will be controlled um, by the Scottish Government. Uh, there has to be um, certain factors taken into account by the Scottish Government and also consultation with the Scottish Government. So my expectation is that it's the Scottish Government that will confirm when they are happy and uh, will reach the stage to move to the next step um, and also uh, having consulted uh, with what we believe would be Construction Scotland. Uh, on that move to the next step. So I think the answer is we don't know. What the indication has been that the move to the next step certainly won't be any earlier um, than two weeks after the 28th of May. So it could happen before the 18th of June, but it's not, as I understand it, a decision purely for an individual contractor to make. The indication seems to be that the Scottish Government will let us know when it's possible to move to phase two. It might, might be worth just adding to that that there was an interesting, I think, open letter to the industry last night from Ron Fraser of Construction Scotland urging um, contractors to submit evidence um, to him so that it can be collated and put to the government to show the government that the measures are being put in place and that contractors are being responsible and they're ready to go. So all your signage, all your one-way direction um, facilities and all of that, that that's all been taken care of and so that when you have the soft start you're you're ready to go so as gavin says it's still uh, for the government to state its position on it but at least there is um there are steps being taken to provide evidence to the government to try and persuade them that the industry is ready um another question this one might be for uh, lynn um in relation to the difference between indoor and outdoor space and whether there is any specific guidance in relation to indoor construction sites and health and safety considerations um, or if there's no specific guidance is it just um, a key issue in terms of risk assessment yeah i'm happy do you want to come back on that one yeah happy to finella um Susan, just to, to address your query, there's there's a lot of guidance out there um, and where there's not specific Scottish guidance that may be directly in point with, with what you're talking about, the UK government has certainly produced um, guidance that may be more relevant for you, looking at um, really probably looking at factories and manufacturing, but, but that may deal with some of the issues that you're looking at in relation to construction. And you're entirely right, your risk assessment should be what underpins all of the decisions that you make around the measures um, that requ are required to identify the risks that you, um, you assess. So you, ha you have to go through that process. And it's worth having a look at um, a range of guidance to see for specific areas. So some of the construction guidance will be relevant. Um, there may be other issues around, as you mentioned, uh, confined space and perhaps lack of ventilation, which may be more relevant in a, a factory or manufacturing context where you could get um, some guidance as to the sort of mitigation that may be required to address those risks. Um, you know, it's worth looking at the guidance because across the range of it, because that's there to assist you in complying with your duties. Um, so don't be, you know, tied to just one specific uh, area um, or or tag of of something. Have a have a look across the board. It's slightly overwhelming, and I know that you're not alone. So a lot of clients are are finding their way here, and we're very happy to to help point you in the right direction. Um, if we can. So feel free to get in touch after this if, if it would help. Maybe I'd just add, um, Vanella, that... Um, we, we slightly... I was going to just add, Vanella, that actually um, Susan might find helpful the uh, Construction Scotland website, which has the more detailed restart plan, which does give some indication of um, anticipated um, resource levels on site on projects where um, there is limited space. 
Thanks, Phil. Okay, thanks. Um, we've just run over five minutes. One um, other question that's come in privately, but I, I suspect there isn't to this, but just to pick up on it, the question was, should all mothballed contracts require a variation in an event? Gavin, James, I suspect there's not a generic answer to that, is there? Do you want to just touch briefly on it before we close? Sure. James, do you want to cover that or shall I pick up? Um, yeah, I, th I think there is no generic answer to that. Um, as Even as Kate said, touching on issues associated with acceleration and adjusting the dates for completion, I think inevitably there will be variations to contract, um, particularly when you're reassessing the site and reopening will be a, a re-evaluation of programme for one. Um, to see whether or not the relevant methodologies of work are consistent with what we have to do with current guidance. Um, and I, I can see variations dealing with that, extending the period of time, perhaps touching on um, force majeure and a possible the emergence of a different strain of COVID-19. So these are the sort of things that, that, um, that we're coming across. Um, Equally, we're looking at um, quite significant omissions from contracts where parts of the project are no longer viable or desired or capable of being delivered. So uh, I think it's not one size fits all. It's just looking at particular context of the project and, and, and considering whether or not the, I suppose, the commercial risks and the drivers of the project have changed in dealing with those changes in terms of variations. Gavin? Gavin? No, I think that's, that's absolutely right. I mean, it will, it will, it will vary uh, from project to project, and we are seeing it on a day-to-day -day basis vary from project to project. There is no blueprint uh, for this, um, which actually makes it very, very interesting, but also very, very challenging for a lot of people in the market. So not necessarily, uh, and if there is a amendment to the contract, each one will look very different, I think. So generally our answer to that question is you need to speak to us about the terms of the contract. But anyway, so we'll just wrap up there and say thank you so much um, for joining us. Um, we do have a lot of um, COVID material on our website. Please do have a look. We'll be sending some of the more recent stuff out following up from this webinar. Um, please do engage with us. Um, let us know if you've got other issues that you haven't wanted to raise just now or that occur to you. Um, as a result of this webinar, please do get in touch and we'd be delighted to hear from you. So thank you very much for joining us today and we'll close on that. Thanks. Goodbye. Thanks all. Bye.